Hopefully everybody's having a great morning so far. I know I am, I had my coffee, got my water. Mr. James has his guitar, that's always a good morning. It's a great morning. <laughs> it's a busy morning. And that's the best kind of morning. I count on my hands the amount of times I wear a hat during a year, but here we are. Corn I like season. it, you know, it's great. Yeah. This is this is this is the the look that I had for probably about eight years of my life. Never never didn't anything to my hat. <laughs> a lifetime ago when I did construction. The only kind of hat that I've ever made a habit of wearing are those boonie hats. I love those. Wait, wait, what what do you mean boonie hats? Explain so that. The the boonie hat it's it's the all cloth hat that doesn't have like a stiff brim and it's like it's like a like a fishermen like to wear them a lot. Okay. They're they're cool. I love those. Oh, I know what you Okay. All right. They they're called boonie hats? Boonie, that's what they're called. Boonie hats. And the first one I saw one was actually in a movie. I saw somebody wearing one. It was like some 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 action military movie from Forever Gone. It's like, oh, that's so cool. I got to have one. And that's been the only kind of hat I've really worn since then. A very carefree hat. How are you doing this morning, Chris? Spencer, how are you? Are we in the car this morning? That is super cool. I love how convenient Zoom is. All the time with my kids, I can't tell you how many Zoom conferences I have done with my kids in the car from point A to point B. It's, uh, it's awesome. It is a great use of time. All right, now we're going to start the ball rolling here. It's 11-11. Uh, hopefully a couple more people will roll in over the next, uh, <laughs> over the next few minutes. Um, we've got, uh, you have some controls on your Zoom panel that I want you to be aware of. In your chat box, you are able to send me questions or comments as we go through this, and I welcome them. I am excited to hear any and all questions that you have. <clears throat> and then in your participants button, you can you have the option to press a button that says raise your hand, and that puts a little hand right up next to your name icon. Um, if you have a question, you can throw that up. If or, or if you uh, uh, if you've got something else, uh, please feel free to hit that raise your hand button. And then at the end of each slide or each segment, I'm going to be able to come back and make sure we answer any and all questions that you have. Okay, uh, we're going to wait about one more minute to get rolling here, and then we're going to we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about all different kinds of music through the eras. We're going to start in the 1600s, and we're going to make our way all the way up to year 2000. Now, we're not gonna get super, super far into detail about everything. I wanna give you guys sort of an outline or an overview of what's going on, and then hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we can have a, a more in-depth study of each individual era, okay? Uh, I've got the slideshow to go with this, so a lot of the time we're gonna have that up on your screen. Uh, you can read through the slides, and again, if you have any questions, put your raise hand sign up, <clears throat> and then uh, you can also type into the message box here. Um, to um, to ask some questions, uh, like Mr. James just did. He's testing it out, and the answer is yes. Yes, we are. Um, okay, so we've got Richard, Spencer, Chris, Mr. James. This is going to be a lot of fun. I had so much fun putting this class together over the last week. Um, this is some some content, some information that I'm really passionate about, um, it, and it helps in so many ways your ability to play and perform music um, today. A lot of this stuff happened you know, 400 years ago, but it's still relevant today, and there's a reason why <clears throat> it's been a, a pre predominant source of study over the last even 100 years, especially in younger music education. Uh, all right, it looks like we've got Celine and Ethan here too. I'll go over uh, some more of that stuff uh, in just a little bit. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box, send those to me, or you can hit the raise hand function under your participants window. All right. Let's see. Okay.
All right, everybody, here we go. Once again, thanks for joining in. Make sure you raise your hand and you ask your questions when you have them. <coughs> okay, so music history goes back to about the year 1200. That's about as far back as we have really, really accurately recorded information about music history. We're not gonna start that far back. So we're gonna leave off the medieval, so you know, like knights in armor kind of things. We're gonna leave out that kind of music right this second. And then we also have Renaissance music. So if you think, you know, Italian Leonardo da Vinci kind of era, uh, we're gonna leave that up too. And we're gonna focus, we're gonna jump right into what we call the Baroque era or the 17th century. Now, the dates for each of these eras are actually a little bit subjective. Musicologists haven't figured out exact dates that they all agree. But in general, the 17th century is considered Baroque. So, you know, on, on TV or movies, you see all those guys with the big white, you know, puffy wigs and all of that. These are these people. These guys like to wear those wigs. Not my favorite look, but they enjoyed it. Okay, so Baroque era music. It was a very specific kind, and all of these eras have their own style or their own rules and things that go with them. Baroque era music is typically shorter, shorter pieces um, that flow and, and ramble on. They don't have a lot of, oh, look at that, someone, someone okay, uh, oops. Oh, that was interesting. Um, they, they were shorter and they kind of rambled on together and worked through that. Um, if I could have you guys please refrain from making annotations on the screen, that would be fantastic. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, sorry about that. Baroque era music kind of was short and rambly. So, if you think about in your in your books, a lot of the the, uh, in, your, in your piano books, a lot of the guitar books too have Baroque era music. They're generally pretty short, one to two lines, and they have a simple melody, kind of goes on and then it stops. And there's not a whole lot of <clears throat> harmonies and things like that. And a lot of this was done because a lot of it was dance music. So as you're working through like your minuets and all of that stuff, and a lot of the folk music that we have comes from this Baroque dance music um, style. So think about like a waltz or things like that. Now, that's actually a super important fact because we use that format in a lot of our music today. All of our repeats and things like that um, come through this kind of style, this dance music, because a lot of this music, all this dancing happened at, you know, really fancy parties, stuff like that. And because of that, we needed a way for musicians to play music on and on and on so that people could dance to it. So instead of having, you know, 12 pages written out of all this music, oftentimes it would be one page and it would have all sorts of repeats on it. And a lot of that is how we got our repeats and repetition signs um, today. Some fun facts about music from this era also was the orchestra didn't really exist. We didn't have a large scale orchestra. You know, when you go to you know, on YouTube and you're looking at music like symphonies and stuff like that, we've got these 50, 60, 70 people all together playing instruments. That was not a big thing with Baroque era music. Not a, not a super prevalent thing. Instead it was small ensembles or solo performers, solo recitals. Uh, things like this were, were sort of the predominating one. And vocal stuff was really popular too. A lot of chorus type music was put together. A fun fact, probably the funnest fact for all of you is that the piano had not been invented yet for the Baroque era, most of the Baroque era. We did not have a piano. As common as an instrument it is now, we didn't have one. It wasn't around yet. It didn't come until the year 1700. And I could do hours and hours and hours of talks about the piano. Uh, but for now, suffice it to say, the piano didn't invent, it wasn't invented yet. And at the start of the Baroque era, we didn't even have real violins, or at least the ones that we use today. Violins, cellos, guitars were not around, ukuleles were certainly not around. There were a lot of instruments that we use today that we, that we think, you know, those are super old instrument, old style. <coughs> Excuse me, we don't actually have those just quite yet in the Baroque era. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about Baroque composers. Look at all these guys with their wigs. They look ridiculous. I could never wear one of those. I thought about it one time. Maybe, maybe some year for like Halloween, I'll come to work dressed up in my, in my wig, looking like a Baroque composer, that might be fun. Okay, <clears throat> so we have three composers right here 
um, that are that are sort of particularly interesting for one reason or another, and who kind of embody the the spirit of the Baroque era. We've got Bach, Vivaldi, and Handel, and we're going to listen to some excerpts of their music. But first, I'm going to go through some some facts for each one. Um, Bach is kind of considered the last Baroque composer, kind of headed into the classical era, which is the next one, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, Vivaldi um, has some fun facts, and Handel as well. Handel has some of the most played music of all time. Every single piano curriculum that you can get is going to have music from Handel. Uh, a lot of us in our books, we've got the Surprise Symphony, right? This is in almost every music book ever, and we're going to we're going to look at some more other music by him. Uh, so let's get into this. We're going to listen to some music. I think we're going to do Vivaldi for today uh, because he's got some of the most uh, most commonly do you uh, listened to and uh, shared music there. So while that's going to come up uh, there, uh, spring, summer, winter, these are the these are the seasons, four seasons by uh, by Vivaldi is what we're going to look at that. And there's lots of good stuff in here. We're gonna take a look specifically at uh, the first one, spring, because it's spring. I didn't know this, I totally forgot about this, but it is officially spring now. <clears throat> and so that's, that's kind of cool. We're gonna look at spring, and I want you to listen to the kinds of instruments being used, the kind of music being played, um, and just make, make a little note in your head, or if you want to on a piece of paper, Think about how many instruments do I hear? How many different kinds, maybe? Um, what kind of instruments are being uh, played? Um, the style of music, does it ramble? All of that. I want you to take a listen, and we're going to see uh, some of this music here. So if you don't have your uh, volume turned up very high, you might need it a little bit higher. Um, if you have trouble hearing it, send me a message. Let me know. We are going to take a listen. of us have heard this before. This is not a, a new song by any means. This is Spring by Vivaldi. There's not a lot of performers there. Excuse me, not a whole lot of musicians. <coughs> but we have some instruments that sound like violins. We've got some cellos in there, some other fun stuff. All right, now a lot of Baroque music follows this kind of trend. It's very light, it's very playful, it rambles on, it moves on and on and on. Vivaldi is this middle guy there. He's that he, he's the uh, he's the drawing looking one right in the middle. All of these are sketches or drawing. None of these are pictures because we didn't have a camera yet, so we couldn't take pictures. But that middle one looks most like a, a sketch or a drawing. That's Vivaldi right there. Um, I'm going to walk you through some some really interesting facts about each of these composers real quick. Um, a fun uh, or something to note about most composers and most musicians through history is that they made a lot of money through their careers. Um, but a lot of times they had to spend all of that money on supporting their families and, and acquiring new materials. It's very expensive to be a musician. You had to really, really, really love it back in the day. So uh, a lot of these composers that we're going to look at made a lot of money and were really famous, really popular. But by the end of their lives, they, they didn't have anything left. And a lot of them died very poor. And a lot of them, we don't even know where they've been buried. Some of them we do, but uh, like Mozart uh, is, is somewhere in an unmarked grave. We have no idea where he is uh, because he died so poor, he didn't have money to, to actually buy um, a, a gravestone. Um, so Bach is actually the middle of a dynasty of composers. He was orphaned at 10 years old, and I found this fact incredibly interesting. He was known to brawl with his students. He would have fights with them. Uh, which I'm very grateful is something that definitely does not happen today. Um, Vivaldi, um, a great deal of his music is lost, actually. We don't have it anymore. Uh, he would write a lot of stuff and send it to friends and family, and they would just kind of store it away. <clears throat> so we don't have all of his music, and we're finding more of it. You know, every, every couple of years, somebody will find a box of old music from Vivaldi somewhere. 
Um, and most people don't know, he was actually a priest for the Catholic Church for a great many years before he decided to, to be a composer. Um, Handel, he's the next composer here. He liked to write music for specific themes. So you know we'll have, especially in today's music, uh, we'll have a song about a specific subject, maybe a specific person or an event. That was not a hugely popular or practice uh, um, experience until the Baroque era and Handel made it super popular. But even after that, it wasn't really something that we did and that we had um, a lot of, okay? Um, now is a great time. Uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, we can get to those uh, for the Baroque era here. The Baroque era. Now, Baroque is not a specific um, uh, term that means uh, something that you like. It's not a word that has a translation. It's just a way to label or reference uh, this era, Baroque. It kind of comes between the Renaissance and the Classical era. All right, I don't see any hands up, and I do not see any messages in my in my box here. Okay, then we get to talk about the next era. Uh, classical music. Now, classical music is sort of a really broad term that we use to describe any music that's super old, but that's not an accurate <clears throat> description of that. Classical music is a specific era, very specific era, and we're going to explore some of that. Now, I love the classical music and I love talking about it because that's where most of the rules and stuff that we use in music now actually come from. So a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about here is extremely relevant to everybody's music, whether you play guitar, piano, anything like that. All of it here is going to be super useful. For example, out of classical music, we get the verse chorus kind of structure that we use in a lot of our pop songs today. The format of classical music was often um, broken down into letters. So for example, you would have part A, part B, part A, part B, part C, and you would have it you know, broken up into different formats. They have lots of names for those, but for right now, we're just gonna call it the verse chorus structure. That came out of the classical era. Also, the idea of combining more instruments with vocals came in, and so uh, you could kind of look at it as like a primitive band coming together. A lot of that was really started off in the classical era. The classical era is largely considered to encompass the 18th century, which would be the 1700s. Again, these dates nobody particularly agrees on. We have sort of generalized ideas of, of when these begin and when they stop. But, this, but the, the 1700s, the 18th century, is generally considered to be the classical era. Now, there were a lot of rules that came out of the classical era for music, how to play music, how to read and write music. Um, and this has largely become to what we refer to as music theory. A lot of our theory comes from the classical era. Uh, some popular composers that we're going to look at in just a second, uh, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, and again, all of these guys are in your piano curriculums, violin curriculums, cello curriculums, guitar curriculums, all of these guys, you know, Ode to Joy, um, uh, uh, Fur Elise, uh, Symphony in C, Concerto in C, all of these really popular tunes are, are from this particular era, the classical era. Um, there were there were so many rules, in fact, that there are books and books and books and books of all of these rules that you can find. Um, but we'll, we'll get to some more of that in a little bit. Uh, we also have more of this idea of programming, which is what Handel did, where he took a specific idea or a concept and made a song all about that. Um, some popular ones from the classical era are actually about fish. It's kind of a strange subject to write a bunch of songs about, but we have a lot of songs from the classical era that are about fish. And we call this programming, kind of like the, the same way you would you know, sit at a computer and do some coding, programming ideas and concepts in your computer. We called it the same thing for music. Uh, in the classical era, we also began to see uh, orchestras come out and huge symphonies being written, but not no longer for little ensembles with just a few people, tons of people, 50, 60, 70, sometimes more performers. And, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was kind of a, a scientific challenge at the time to see how many people you could to come together and play music at the same time. So it was kind of an, an early attempt to do something similar to what we're doing right now, where we're all going to get together. We're going to talk about music, listen to music, but they didn't have a lot of stuff like we do, we do, like the internet. So they would have to actually come together and play music together 
Um, and, and that idea kind of took off as they were sharing ideas and stuff and they started performing and, and, and sharing with other people the stuff that they would work on uh, together. And the last thing on this, on this slide right here, we, we have the piano now. We do have a piano for the classical era, but for the next 150 years, it's gonna go through refinements. It's gonna get bigger. It's gonna get longer. We're gonna add more keys, more notes to the piano. And it's gonna become more refined until finally it becomes the instrument that we have today. And we're gonna be talking about the piano a little bit more. And I like to include it in here as a reference point to kind of think about how far we've come from the music and the instruments and the technology of the time and look at what we have right now. All right, the famous classical composers. Now these guys look a lot cooler, I think, than the Baroque era composers. Uh, we've got Beethoven, Mozart, and Haydn. And there we have their pictures. I have the same ones left to right. The first guy right there is Beethoven and he looks all angry and scowly. Um, and a lot of his music reflects that. It sounds very, very bold, very brash, very loud. And uh, of course, uh, everybody knows Beethoven was, uh, was deaf later in life. And that's when he wrote a lot of his best music. He couldn't hear a thing. And he wrote some of the most revolutionary music for his time. Um, and uh, kind of changed the way. He paved the, the pathway for the next era. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But... Uh, one of the things that surprised me the most when I was learning about Beethoven was that he was such a daydreamer. Sometimes he would be like in the middle of a lesson, uh, working with somebody, teaching somebody, and he would just kind of doze off and, and have this daydream and to the point where he was completely not listening, not looking, not thinking about um, his students, and sometimes for hours at a time, and they'd have to just, you know, get up and walk away. They couldn't bring him back from it. And as great a musician as he was, he hated teaching music, which is why we don't have a lineage of students from Beethoven. He did not like to teach. It was not, uh, it was not in his nature, and he did not have the patience for it. <clears throat> right here, we've also got the middle picture right there. That is Mozart. He's one of the youngest, most brilliant composers of the classical era. By the age of five, he was a proficient pianist. By the age of 10, he was performing internationally, and by the age of 11, he had published his first opera, which was not an easy thing to do. Even for a career musician, operas were a really difficult thing to manage because as the writer of the opera, you had to come up with a story, you had to write the story, you had to write the music, you had to orchestrate the parts, you had to hire the musicians and the actors, and you had to direct it too. If you design an opera, you had to direct it and kind of make your own little movie out of it. And by 11 years old, he had done that successfully. The last guy there, the one on the right, that is Joseph Haydn. Um, and he is, he's one of the, um, the predominant father figures of the uh, classical era. A lot of people, uh, his, his pupils and, and students and friends and family, they call him Papa Haydn. He liked to, he liked to have fun and um, he really enjoyed uh, practical jokes and, and things like this. And so he would, he would often uh, have a great time with his students and pupils. And so we gave him the nickname Papa Haydn. He is one of the few musicians, we were talking about how a lot of times they made a lot of money, but they didn't necessarily uh, keep a lot of it. He lived very frugally and he was one of the few musicians ever from the Baroque and the classical era who were actually able to uh, amass a, a fortune and retire. We're going to listen to some of uh, some music by Beethoven. A lot of this will be super familiar. We've got Fur Elise, right? The Moonlight Sonata, um, symphonies, concertos, all sorts of stuff. We're going to pull up Beethoven and just take a quick sample of his music. Now, the form of a lot of this music is, is very structured. It has a lot of rules and regulations about what you can and cannot do. And so a lot, because of that, a lot of it is repetitive to a certain level. And we see a lot of that in our music today too. But we're going we're gonna to open up Beethoven here and we're gonna take a listen to some of his music. I'll work. All right, and then after this, we're gonna, I'm gonna hop over to my messages and see if anybody's got any questions. I don't see any hands up right this second, uh, but we, if you do have any, now would be a great time as, we, as we're listening to this to, to send those in, send those over. Oh, there's a hand, perfect. We'll get to that in just a second. All right, here is our good friend Beethoven.
all right, that's for Elise. And it's, it's repetitive. The next part is the same. Then we have a new section and, and back and forth and back and forth. This theme keeps coming in and out, back and forth. Um, all right, Ethan and Celine have a hand up. And their question is, which one is handle in the picture? Let's hop back over there real quick. And we can talk about that. Boom, takes a second to get this up. All right, so in this picture right here, uh, from left to right, we have Beethoven, Mozart, and Haydn. He is the one on the far right-hand side. Uh, a lot of times uh, in this era, they would still wear wigs a lot of times, but in, by this time it had become such a fashion that people would actually grow their hair out. And so um, they would have these long, all of these guys would be wearing these long, white, curly hair things, but instead of wigs, now they were actually people's hair. Kind of, a, kind of an interesting fact going on there. All right, after the classical era, we get to hop on over here to the romantic era, the 19th century, so the 1800s. Now, uh, romantic era music has nothing to do with the idea of romance itself. This is a name we gave it because a lot of the format of romantic era works is, is very personal. We, we kind of break away from the idea of following the rules and playing and writing music the way that we're supposed to. And instead, we come across this idea of playing sounds that we like. So a lot of times in classical music, we have very square harmonies. By the time we finally get to romantic music, we get to open this up a little bit and use bigger, more expressive kind of sounds. And so it was, it was a very different, very colorful way of thinking about and looking at music. And we, um, a lot of these concepts come from the ideas of trying to combine as many notes as you can without them having to fight each other, without the notes arguing and not getting along. Uh, and so we call these lush or colorful chords. And we finally got to use more of them in the Romantic era. We saw them in the classical era, but definitely not very many. And they were not popular. Oftentimes, uh, critics would get after <clears throat> various composers who would use them, and they'd get poor scores, poor reviews on, on their releases and their music. Now, a really important reason today to, to appreciate this from the Romantic era is that from this point forward, musicians were now composing and writing music in ways that they wanted to, in ways that they thought were interesting. We no longer had to stick to the rules of you've got to write it this way and you've got to play it this way and you have to do all of this process. Now, it was very, uh, very personal, very individualized. Everybody was writing the music that they wanted to hear instead of that society was pressuring them to write. Um, and during this time, uh, music is getting longer and longer and longer because people are, are looking for more and more ways to be unique with their music. So, you know, the Baroque is very short, classical is a little bit longer, and here we are in the Romantic era. Some, uh, some works, some pieces took an entire weekend to play. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, eight-hour days of playing music. Uh, the Ring Cycle is a really popular one. It has nothing to do with Lord of the Rings. A lot of people ask me, is that from Lord of the Rings? No, no, it's not. And yes, it does take an entire weekend to watch all of the movies, but we don't have, uh, they're not related. They don't go together. The Ring Cycle was like a like a kind of like a play or an opera, and it was this huge story. Um, and so uh, it would often be like a weekend activity. You'd you'd go into town, <clears throat> you'd you'd rent a hotel room or something like that, and, and it would have to be in a park because the the orchestras were so huge, they were one to two hundred people, and then you've got all of the actors, all of the equipment, the instruments and stuff like that. So they would often put it in like a public park. You would just go to town and for an entire weekend, there'd be like a, a, a big festival around it. So food vendors and all sorts of other, you know, crafts and, and artists would come around and try to try to sell some of their products there too. Um, romantic era orchestras were growing at this point, uh, like for the ring cycle, but the largest orchestra ever assembled, and I, I was doing some research on this because I did not believe it. When I saw the number last week, I was like, there's no way you got that many people together. The largest orchestra ever assembled was several years ago, so it was not in the Romantic era, but they were playing Romantic music. Um, 7,548 musicians got together, and I think it was a football stadium, 
uh, to play some music together. And this was it was a it was a tribute concert to some romantic composer, I believe, but it was also a world record attempt and, and they did it. But orchestras in general during the Romantic era, there were not 7,000 people, but one to 200 musicians and, and instruments was no longer something um, strange. And so concert halls started getting bigger too. Instead of, you know, little, a lot of times people would get together in houses or, or estates or, or large mansions or something like that to perform their music now, we're starting to need specific venues for people to come together. And that created what that will eventually become the idea of like jazz clubs or like Carnegie Hall was an idea um, that uh, was kind of propagated by this romantic era uh, music. So we've got longer music, more colorful music, very individualized music, very personal music coming out of the romantic era. And this is made easier by the fact that we now have a fully functional, completely working, completely designed piano. <coughs> Excuse me. During the, uh, the 19th century, so the 1800s, the piano goes through a lot of extensive review and design work. And we expand it to have the 88 keys that it's got now. And they're, they're becoming, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10 feet long, really nice instruments now. And one of the whole concepts behind the piano was to take an entire uh, ensemble of musicians and reduce it down to something that one person could play by themselves, either as a performance tool or a composition tool. And now we finally have that. So during the Romantic era, music really, really takes off and starts evolving rapidly because it's easy now to have an instrument where you can assign all of these sounds. You can have all of these notes and see how they work together without having to have a group of musicians that you have to practice with. Um, and, and then it also became a, a solo and a performing instrument in its own right during the Romantic era. Lots more stuff for it from there. Um, very good. Uh, one last fun fact about Romantic era music before we look at the composers. Romantic era music is the, is the template or the form that we use when we're looking at movie music, video game music, um, things like that, uh, TV shows. We look at the style and the form of romantic era music, and we, we model a lot of, our, of, of the music that we would listen to in those movies in this way, because it was very, very expressive, very personal, very powerful kind of music. Um, so here are some very famous romantic composers, and there are, there are, for each of these eras, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to thousands of famous and popular composers. Um, I picked some just uh, to, to take a look at. For the romantic ones, I tried to pick ones that were not as, um, not as common because uh, these are the ones that were uh, huge pioneers. A lot of the romantic music stuff that we listen to is, is very stereotypical of the romantic era. These guys really helped shape it. So from left to right on the screen here, we've got Peter Tchaikovsky, Antonin Dvorak, it's not pronounced anything like it looks like, Dvorak, there's a, there's a J in there, and Sergei Rachmaninoff is the guy on the right, from left to right. Now, uh, the middle one is a painting, I believe, but the other two, maybe it's not. Somebody told me it was a painting, but it might be a picture. We finally have a camera during this time period, so we are able to take pictures of these guys. Um, and look how serious they all look. For the, for the kind of music that they wrote. They all had such serious expressions. But that's in part to the fact that cameras were super expensive. So if you were gonna have a picture done, it needed to be a good one that you could use for a lot of things because we didn't have the opportunity to take a whole bunch of pictures. So it needed to be kind of like a one-time deal. It was really expensive. Um, so Tchaikovsky wrote things like um, uh, the Nutcracker Suite, right? Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies. Uh, Rock Maninoff wrote a lot of uh, symphonies and piano music. He loved the piano. Um, in fact, he, he loved the piano so much, and he was um, such a talented performer that he wrote a lot of music that cannot be replicated. We cannot play a lot of his music. And one of the, one of the reasons for that is that the, his hands were so big, so big, that he could reach almost two octaves with one hand. I can get maybe a tenth on a really good day. Definitely not two octaves. He had huge hands. So a lot of his music, we have it, and we, we have to simplify his music to make it possible to play. A lot of it is super, super out there. Dvorak is actually one of my favorite Romantic era composers. He, uh, he moved to the United States from Czechoslovakia, and he had a fascination with trains. 
And so a lot of times he would be, uh, he would just go for train rides just because, and when I was young, I liked trains, so I can, I can get this, I can get with this guy, uh, just to help him compose music, the swaying of the train on the track, the clicking of the track, uh, the consistent, you know, mechanical function of the train was very relaxing to him. And he was, he was really uh, able to get into a, a good creative space as he was uh, doing his composing in the United States. Uh, he did not live indefinitely in the United States. He moved back to Czechoslovakia, I believe, where he, uh, he eventually passed away <clears throat> back there. But some of his most um, exciting work was done here in the United States. And he's the one that wrote uh, in all of your music books. He's got the one Largo or New World. Uh, symphony. He wrote that about the United States, about America. He was a, he was a very um, patriotic, I guess, in that sense. He believed in a lot of the values at the time of the United States, and so he wanted to write a bunch of music. He came here, studied the culture, wrote a lot of music about it, and then um, ended up going back home. Um, these particular composers from this era are really quirky individuals. Uh, for example, Tchaikovsky would never, ever, ever, ever drink bottled water, which is ridiculous for us to think about today. But he was such a germaphobe that he would he would never buy um, prepackaged foods if he could help it, and he never drank from from pre-bottled water that he didn't clean and purify himself. That's a that's another level right there. <clears throat> um, Dvorak suffered from agoraphobia, which is a fear of open spaces. So he liked to be in, in, in smaller rooms. He didn't like big open spaces. Uh, kind of an interesting thing uh, from him. And uh, let's see. Ah, Rachmaninoff liked race cars. Who doesn't though, right? I mean, race cars are pretty cool. He liked fast cars and boats of all things during the Romantic era. Um, the the, the motor, motorized engine, the gasoline engine was, was really taking off and uh, they were starting to put them in boats to get motorized boats and he was fascinated by the idea of motorized boats. We're going to listen to some of this music and we're going to listen to some Dvorak for today. Writing's not that. Oops. It's amazing, but I remember I remember when YouTube didn't have any ads in it. And a lot of people were like, what, that was a thing? Yes, YouTube used to not have ads in it. Um, and then after this slide, we are going to get into, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're gonna get into some of the questions uh, that, you've, that you've sent in. Okay, here is Dvorak. This is a quick little glimpse of romantic era music. Very big kind of sounds. Um, chords are getting bigger. Symphonies are getting bigger. Lots of new instrument ideas are happening. Um, that was largely um, French horns and then an, an oboe was playing that solo right there, I believe. Um, and there's, there's different versions, different arrangements of it. Um, okay, so that's the, that is the romantic era. Um, let's see, we've got a couple of pictures in here. Oh, you guys, sorry, I got the wrong slide. In the first picture, um, I will go back and show that to you in a little bit. All of these are, uh, all of the composers listed from top to bottom 
are going to appear in the pictures left to right. So they're at the top. The first one is the first picture, second, second picture, third is the last picture. Um, but I'll go back and I'll show that to you in a little bit. Um, and then we have we have another question here. Who is my favorite composer and why? That is a great question. And I'm going to give a slightly unfair answer because you're going to have to be era specific because I have favorite composers from each era and all for very different reasons. But for the Romantic era, by far my favorite composer is Dvorak. And on any given day, um, I would probably choose to listen to Dvorak over a lot of other stuff out there. Primarily because I like the way that he does a lot of the programming in his music, and I like the way that he, he brings sounds in from, from different ideas and reduces them down into instrumentation. Uh, one of his string quartets is called the American Quartet. Um, has a lot of really cool sounds. He basically summed up all of culture happening in America at the time into, into one uh, quartet, and it's really cool stuff. I encourage you to listen to it. Um, as far as music goes, that's probably one of my favorite pieces, and Dvorak probably is my favorite composer. If I had to pick just one, it would probably be um, Dvorak. Let's see. I don't see any other hands or questions, so I will take you back really quick to that very first slide, the Baroque composers. Oops. And I'll show you that picture. All right, so on this screen right here, the one on the far right is Handel, George Handel. We've got Bach, Vivaldi, and Handel. All right, now that we're done with the Romantic era, we get into what we call the modern era of music. Now, in musicology, we're quickly changing this name <coughs> away from modern music because when when musicologists came up with this title, modern era music, it was the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And so at the time it was still really modern. However, we are now two decades away from modern era music. And so musicologists are beginning to, to change the way that they refer to it. But for now, we still refer to it as modern music, okay? Uh, during the modern era, we have the, the computer is, is beginning to be developed. Electronic instruments are, are kind of coming out. Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot, of, um, a lot of different scientific discoveries happening, a lot of uh, realizations, a lot of exploration going on. And so the world during the modern era is becoming an increasingly complicated, um, complicated world. Um, we have a lot of automation going on, factories doing a lot of work. Um, lots, lots of really cool things are happening during the modern era. And, and again, that could be a lecture to go on and on and on and on. Also, the modern era is one of the shortest eras that we have in music history. Generally, it's agreed that it only goes from about 1900 to 1950, so only about 15 years. Whereas each of the previous eras can generally be summed up into about 100 year periods. The modern era only lasted about 50 years before it really fell apart because it was not hugely popular. Uh, we basically did a complete 180. We went from the, the very personal, very big and comfortable sounds of the Romantic era, and it all became literally very programmed, very formulated. Uh, and a lot of the music was done on an intellectual level and not at all on a, on a basic individual level. Um, and it was very different than anything we'd seen before in music because we'd always stuck to forms and patterns and things like this. But now we had specific formulas and algorithms to, to basically learn a way to play all 12 notes of the musical alphabet in a random, over, or a random order over and over and over again without repeating the order. That was one of the big things about modern era music. And it was not popular. Basically, you'd end up with something like this. For hours at a time, it was not incredibly popular, but it followed some really cool mathematical ideas at the time and some other intellectual advances as far as uh, computing and science went. And so some composers took this pathway of taking all of that science and turning it into music. Um, and kind of a side effect of that, <clears throat> all of these composers from the modern era thought they were, they were super cool. They thought that they were 
doing a great job and being really awesome. And um, it caused a lot of people around them to really dislike them as people, but also to just generally not accept their work. Whenever they'd have a new song or something come out, a lot of people would simply not go. They wouldn't listen to it. They wouldn't buy it. Um, they wouldn't participate with it because they, they felt such a, a social gap between uh, themselves and the composers. And so modern era music, even in its time, was never super popular. And today we use it as a study tool more than anything else when we're, when we're learning about music. It's really not something that we go into in a great detail as far as playing it. There are some really important things that came out of it. A lot of our sight reading books today come from <clears throat> this, this modern era idea of random notes. So a lot of the most complex uh, sight reading stuff uh, uh, that, that I like to work with and, and work on and that I worked on with some of you guys uh, come from this era because it is extremely challenging to, to play and to think about. Um, at this time, during the modern era, we have the beginnings of electric instruments, too. We've got uh, digital pianos are starting to, to be developed, right? Electronic keyboards, synthesizers, electric guitars a little bit later. Um, we've got so much electricity being used in this era to design new instruments. Things like the theremin were, were um, big tools in the, in the modern music. If you don't know what that is, look it up it's super cool it's a, it's an electrical instrument that basically you control with your hands almost like i don't know it's kind of like a star wars movie and you're like using the force to like control the 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 music it's actually really cool but all of this came out during the modern music era now here are some of the most popular composers and um it's kind of interesting a lot of these these most popular composers still come from Europe, even though the, the United States is well established by this time, a lot of the best composers are still coming, uh, especially now from, from these, these, uh, uh, these uh, Euro Eastern European, Northern, Northeastern European countries, Hungary, Russia, Czechoslovakia, later the Czech Republic. Um, lots, of, lots of composers are coming from here. So all of these guys, they've got interesting you know, uh, expressions on their faces too. We've got Stravinsky, Schoenberg and Bartok from left to right. Uh, now, all of these composers were extremely intelligent. And earlier I was talking about their music not being super popular. That does not mean that they did not make really incredible advances in music for us. For example, um, a lot of these guys revolutionized the way that we teach music today. Um, one of the guys, I didn't have enough time to put them together, but uh, um, uh, Rimsky-Korsakov. Uh, Kodali and all of these guys. A lot of these these guys really pioneered the way that we teach music, the way that we study music, and the way that we look at music. And uh, a lot of this is is from these guys here. So Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Bartok. Um, I'm going to just play a quick sample of their music. I don't want to um, don't want to spend too much time right here on these guys. Um, we're just going to take a quick look at Stravinsky. All right, so this song is called The Rite of Spring. We're just gonna listen to the first little bit, uh, little bit, and it was so unpopular at its debut, people got up and rioted. So that's just a little taste of that very sad, very dissonant kind of music, very dissonant style. Um, and so a lot of the music was like that, and it was very harsh and very difficult to listen to. 
Um, I do not see any other uh, questions or, or hands up uh, right this second. You guys have been fantastic. I love your questions. Hopefully that gave you a little bit of an overview um, of the of music history. I summed a lot of it up and, and I wanted to get to a lot more fun facts, but we, we ran out of time. So over the next couple of weeks, stay tuned for more information. We're going to try to do a few more classes, uh, break down the eras a little bit more individually. Um, I can't wait to do that. Hopefully, hopefully it takes off and it's popular. Um, again, you guys have been super fantastic. <clears throat> I love putting this together for you. And for all of my students out there, um, if you can, just make a couple of notes for me. What were your favorite little pieces of information? Um, let me know if you have favorite composers and all of that throughout your lessons. And if you have other questions, um, I will get to you during your lessons in, in this next week, and we can talk about it some more. You guys have been awesome, and I'll see you next week. Great job, everybody.